We now move on to another important topic as we introduce our next speaker. And this is one that often gets ignored when we think about overall health, dental health. So let us invite our next speaker, Dr. Wilbert Veit, presenting on Your Teeth Are Meant to Last a Lifetime, Prevention, Detection, Health Consequences, and Treatment Modalities. Let's give it up for him. Yay, okay, it works. Okay, well, thank you for this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that's how to keep your teeth. I'm going to kind of keep it simple. How many, how many dentists are here? How many physicians? Okay, so... I'm going to kind of keep it simple. We're going to stick to basically the two um, enemies of keeping your teeth, which is tooth decay or dental caries and periodontal diseases. Let's see. OK. Let's go back a couple of centuries. This is um, the 17th century and the 1600s. And uh, this was basically um, the, the um, advanced uh, dentistry of the day. Uh, the people would uh, uh, wait until they had pain, and then they would have the, the tooth extracted. This is a, a Dutch uh, painter. So this is uh, in, uh, in Europe. And you could see this, this is what uh, a lot of people still think this way, unbelievably. Oops, going the wrong way, sorry. Okay, another Dutch painting in the 1600s. Um, this is what it was when you went to the dentist. Uh, traveling dentists, sometimes they even would extract teeth on horseback, and uh, the reason for that is generally considered that if they caused pain and uh, the person screamed out, the, the mob might go after him and he would make a quick getaway on his horse. Okay, um, this, is, this is from um, the uh, 18th century, 1780 or so. And this was a carving made by a French artist. And it's depicting what used to be believed was the cause of toothaches and it was the tooth worm. Now, how did they get the idea of the tooth worm? I have my theory that uh, the tooth was extracted and it was smashed with a hammer because of all the pain that it was causing, and they looked inside and they found this little pink thing that looked like a worm, and it was actually the pulp of the tooth, or the nerve of the tooth. So, aha, that's what was causing my toothache. I want to read you something from three and a half thousand years ago the Babylonians. This is the time of, uh, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and um, the um, Code of Hammurabi. But just listen to this. This is three and a half thousand years ago. After Al had created heaven, this is their creation myth, the earth had created the rivers. The rivers had created the canals. The canals had created the marsh, and the marsh had created the worm. The worm went weeping before Shamesh, his tears flowing before Ea. What wilt thou give me for food? What wilt thou give me for sucking? I shall give you the ripe fig and the apricot. Of what use are these to me, the ripe fig and the apricot? Lift me up among the teeth and the gums. Cause me to dwell. The blood of the tooth will I suck, 
and the gum will I gnaw the roots. That's three and a half thousand years ago. And this persisted, the, the toothworm idea persisted right up until the 18th century. And uh, that was the year that Leeuwenhoek made his little single lens uh, microscope uh, and um, uh, Robert Hooke uh, discovered the cells of plants. So not that long ago. Let's see, what do we got here next? Okay, so around that time was the American Revolutionary War. Uh, you all recognize this picture, he's on the money of the U US. And in this particular painting, he, all of his teeth were gone except for one, and the artist had to pack cotton into his mouth to bulk out his cheeks to get a good, a good picture. Can you imagine that? I mean, and it, it, it's, uh, it's said that uh, his chronic toothaches and abscesses really affected the, the process of the American Revolutionary War because he had to postpone battles and attacks and everything. Anyway, he lost all his teeth except for one. Here he is as, as a little younger guy, George Washington, and there's a scar on his cheek which is probably due to um, an abscess, dental abscess. This is his last set of dentures. Can you imagine having something like that in your mouth? Oh my gosh. <laughs> the, the upper part is a, a, a swage plate, plate of gold, and there were, um, they often would use human teeth welded onto it or um, ivory carvings. And uh, it's, it's believed that he even purchased teeth from some of his slaves uh, to have them made into his dental prostheses. So that's, uh, well, how many years ago was that? 250 years ago. Okay, so the first big enemy of keeping your teeth is tooth decay. How do we detect it? Well. Okay, the most obvious, the first way is by visual uh, examination, visual looking at it. So these, these teeth here, if you look at these three teeth, okay, so this one looks pretty good. This is a premolar. And if you look in the grooves of this molar, you'll see some dark, uh, coloration, and you could say, well, there's probably decay there. And on the one behind it, you'll see, it uh, de looks like decay in the grooves of that tooth, and you'll see some decay where the tooth has uh, broken, broken out here. Now, the second way is with a radiograph or an x-ray. If we take these same teeth and Where'd it go? Oh no. There you go. Okay, these are the same teeth. Um, the premolar, which looked really fine, now this is reversed because we're look with the photo we're looking into a mirror. Okay, so you couldn't see this decay here, which is this dark area uh, where this decay is forming in between the teeth. And on this molar, you'll see even a larger one. And uh, that one, when we looked visually, we'd only see the decay in the, the grooves of the chewing surface. And look at this one. And right here is the pulp of the tooth, or the, the famous nerve of the tooth. And um, this is what brought the patient into the office because they were feeling pain. So, how in the world uh, does this happen? Okay, well, we know, we know what it is. It's not the toothworm, but I'm gonna show you the, the toothworm later, the toothworms. Uh, it's bacteria which produce acid from sugar. So they metabolize the, the sugar in your Coca-Cola or your Pepsi or your, your donut or your chewing gum or your mint or whatever it is, 
and they produce acid for about 20, up to 20 minutes. The acid uh, dissolves the mineral structure of the tooth and allows the bacterial colony to invade into the tooth. So it's like, um, you know, like a mining procedure. They're dissolving their way into the tooth. The thing is, uh, it's the frequency of exposure that we know is one of the most important things if you want to prevent decay. The more frequently it's going on your teeth, whether it's from a beverage or, or a snack or whatever, people snacking on candy bars, whatever it is, uh, you could figure, well, the bacteria are gonna absorb that sugar and produce acid for up to 20 minutes with every exposure. So the, the less frequently that it's getting on the teeth, the more you, you have the ability to uh, prevent further decay. Now as dentists, what we do, we try to catch these cavities when they're much, much smaller, obviously. And, um, but I, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, what can be done in a little bit. Okay, whoops. I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Okay, so this is a much bigger cavity, which is really obvious. We can identify this with, with uh, visual. And um, you'll see how the bacteria have invaded in here. They dissolved away the, the hard structure of the tooth and the walls of the tooth are, are the strength is compromised, they're, they're um, thinned out. And uh, so what do you do with a tooth like this? Well, in the old days, it would be extracted. Sometimes it is extracted today. It depends on uh, many different factors. But let's see. Oops. OK. So here's the tooth with the decay removed. It had uh, the nerve removed from the tooth. And you'll see that the walls of the tooth are shortened so that when we do the big bonded filling, we can cover the wall so the tooth doesn't split apart down the middle. And we also use some tiny little titanium screws that go into the tooth for additional retention. So the, the, the the lesson here is uh, don't give up. Uh, even if it's a big cavity, the tooth can be preserved and saved uh, rather than extraction and then having to deal with that. And here's what it looked like after restoring it with bonded composite filling material. So the walls are covered. This is protecting it from, from fracture. Uh, ultimately, this uh, would be recommended to eventually do a crown or a cap on the tooth to hold everything together from the outside. Okay, here's another example of a, uh, a disaster. This is a big tooth-colored filling in this tooth. The outer wall fractured off. It was just hanging by the gums. And this tooth also had decay uh, in between the teeth. What can we do with this? Okay, so rather than extracting the tooth, and by the way, there are cases where you, you, you should not extract a tooth if there's certain medical conditions, such as bisphosphonate medication, where you, if you do it, uh, the, um, the osteoclasts basically, because the bone, the, the, the alveolar bone, which I'll get to later, is constantly remodeling itself. You have osteoblasts, uh, creating more bone, you have osteoclasts dissolving away the bone, so your bone is in a constant state of, of, of being uh, replaced. Um, and with uh, bis bisphosphonate, sometimes the, the osteoclasts are inactivated and the bone doesn't heal properly and you can get osteonecrosis of the bone, drug-induced drug if we were to extract the tooth if that were this person. Okay, so here it is, uh, restored, using filling material. Now here again, we, because it's a giant filling, we would recommend a crown on the tooth to hold it together better, but the tooth was saved. These are pictures of some crowns. You see, uh, this is the typical crown of uh, many, many decades. This is porcelain fused to metal. 
And it's kind of like the shape of a sewing thimble that you'd put over your finger. It holds the tooth together from the outside and it's bonded onto the tooth. Today, we're mo most of these crowns, uh, we're using um, zirconia porcelain. It's an all porcelain crown. And uh, this is, this is, this is a, a little bridge with crowns um, holding a replacement tooth. And of course, they can made, made, be made in all different shades. Uh, to match the, the person's teeth. Okay, so this, this is the other uh, demon, this is the other um, problem with saving teeth, and keeping them for a lifetime. Uh, this is an illustration of some periodontal disease. This is, um, gum, of course, gum disease. Uh, when you look at this, you'll see that the gums are coming off the roots of the teeth. You'll see the, the gum tissue. We have two uh, aspects. This is the gum tissue, which is um, firmly attached to the bone. It's called the attached gingiva. And then below that, you have the mucosa, which is not attached to the bone. It's flexible. Um, what, what the heck is causing this? Well, it's bacteria. The bacteria are making a, uh, a coating on the teeth, on the roots, and uh, inciting the inflammatory process. They be, their gums are becoming inflamed from the bacteria. And this is causing the gums to come off the roots. It's almost as if the, the body was rejecting the teeth because of their bacterial coating. And in this particular case, the, the gums are coming off and they're receding and the, the, and the roots are becoming uncovered. You'll also see some hard, crusty material forming here. This is where the, the bacterial biofilm becomes uh, calcified by the minerals in the saliva. Uh, the bacteria that are causing this destruction are not only producing toxins, but there's also a, uh, a localized allergic response of the tissue to these bacteria. So it's a combination of toxins and the local, localized response. The hallmarks of inflammation in the gums is swelling. So these are swollen up. They can become very tender, although most of the time people that have this disease don't feel any pain, which is unfortunate because they don't come in and get treated with this, there's no pain often. And, um, So the, um, the, uh, the inflammation, the inflammatory process, uh, these cells are producing enzymes which cause destruction of, this, of the soft tissue, the attachment. These enzymes, proteases, dissolve the protein and different enzymes. It causes the tooth basically to become rejected. Now, in... Okay, this is an example with, um, of uh, mostly gingivitis here. This is where the, the gums themselves uh, are, are inflamed, but there's not that much destruction um, of, of the bone. But what we will see here is that when we, when we measure the gums, uh, we can tell how much of the gum has come off of the root. If it comes off more than, say, three millimeters, we call it a pocket. And what's the bad thing about pockets is that, well, if, if the gums are coming off and there's a space between the root and the tooth, you can't really clean it, you can't brush it. And the other thing about it is that the, um, there's a transition over into what we call anaerobic bacteria, and these are more um, damaging to the tissues. The anaerobes like to live down in the pocket where there's no oxygen. Okay, so this is how we measure. This is a periodontal probe and it's marked here in three, three millimeter increments. And you could see here um, uh, there's some gum, gum recession the root is from here where the enamel stops all the way down to here. 
Now, if the, if the gum had not receded, you would have a three, six, nine, 10 millimeter pocket between the gum and the, and the root. Um, the, the body's defense mechanisms here, um, you know, are, are overwhelmed. The, um, uh, there's, uh, of course, vitamin D is one of the uh, activators of certain peptides called um, defensins and catholocytins which actually are, be, are produced and they attach themselves onto the bacteria, penetrate through the cell wall of the bacteria and destroy the bacteria. They're also um, uh, effective against viruses. I'm told I don't know what the mechanism is. But of course, then you have um, the, the white blood cells, the macrophages and all that. But it's the, the body's defenses is resulting in the destruction of the, uh, of the um, what's holding the teeth in the mouth. Uh-oh, oh, here we go, okay. So this is a, uh, a radiograph or an x-ray. I think my battery's going low showing the, the bone loss that's occurring along this root. Um, now you could see, uh, let's see what this, you could see how the, the bone has got, come down from uh, up at the top of the tooth, you'll see where it's lighter, that's the crown of the tooth where the enamel is, but from there down is the root of the tooth. And you have a horizontal bone loss, the bone is going down, uh, it's also vertical bone loss right along the root. So this would be deep pockets where you have um, pathogenic bacteria, mostly anaerobes, living in there and causing further destruction. Okay, here's another example of some front teeth where... Um, Extreme bone loss has occurred. Sorry, my. Do you have another pointer? This? Yep. Oh, let's see. How does this one work? What do you push? This one. This one for pointer? Oh, no, oh for pointer. pointer. Ah, okay. Oh, thank you. Beautiful. Okay. So this tooth here, you see it had root canal treatment. The nerve had to be removed from the tooth. This is the root canal filling. The bone loss is occurring around these roots. So from here all the way up, this is bone loss. And these teeth, uh, typically, as they get loose, they'll start to wiggle, and uh, the person becomes aware there's something going on here. Um, now, the tooth worm is active here. How do, we, how do we treat this? Well, we treat it with um, diff different methods. Uh, let me see. Let's see if I have to use this one to progress it. All right, this is another one on some back teeth. You see the bone loss that's occurring around the, uh, the roots of, of these teeth. This is the maxillary sinus here. This is your sinus. So the roots of this molar are right up into the floor of the sinus. We're getting uh, extreme bone loss. Uh, this is pretty much uh, hopeless, hopelessly um, uh, involved here. Okay, well, how do we treat this? Well, there's dental floss. Uh, of course, uh, with dental floss, um, you can't get down into pockets. And uh, many people uh, find it too complicated to wrap this, this string around their fingers and get it between the teeth, clean the teeth with an up and down movement. That's the, pretty much has been the gold standard for many, many years. Okay, these are some devices. If you can't use dental floss, okay, you have 
dental floss holders. They sell them in all the supermarkets and pharmacies. This is good for between the front teeth. This is good for between the back teeth. And remember with floss, you want to use an up and down scraping motion. It's not a, not a sawing motion, which many people do incorrectly. So it's up and down to scrape the, the biofilm off the surface of the roots. Uh, these little brushes also are very helpful for many people. They come in different uh, sizes, different diameters. This is good for in between the front teeth to remove the biofilm. Uh, some of them can be bent at a right angle. This one is more for back teeth. And if you have big gaps, bigger gaps, you can use this type of an interproximal brush to clean in between the teeth. The whole idea is to remove the bacteria to prevent decay, the acid-producing bacteria that, pro that produce decay, and to prevent and to um, control periodontal disease. Okay, so if you have bridge work where crowns are connected together and you want to get your floss underneath, these are, these are called floss threaders, and it's like a flexible sewing needle. You put your floss through the loop, you thread this underneath the bridge, and then you can go back and forth underneath the bridge to clean the undersurface of the, of the non-removable bridge. Floss threaders. Okay, the water pick, this is a good gadget also because you can flush water between your teeth it flushes out food particles. Uh, it also will rinse out some of the bacteria. Um, and we also can uh, add some uh, antibacterial uh, solution into the water uh, to actually flow into pockets. So to get uh, an antiseptics, antibacterials into pockets, um, Either squirting with a syringe or using a water pick can be very helpful. Okay, so we're looking a little more closely now. Uh, most of us today are using these magnification loops. Not only can we see much more, but also it really helps on our, you know, our lower back if we're always getting down close and trying to get in there. So this is a, a very, very helpful thing for dentists today. Now here are some, uh, this is a little Gary Larson humor, early microbiologists. Looking very close, very closely. I like this guy over here, I mean, he's, he's really looking there. Okay, here's our face, face contrast uh, microscope, along with a, with a video camera and a screen. Here's what we see, another Gary Larson. Okay, husband and wife, they're arguing over, um, over his activities. And he says, I got use for new, I have news for you, sweetheart. I really am the lowest form of life on earth. Gary Larson. Okay, here we are. This is uh, looking in now. We can activate that. Okay, so we're looking at the screen. So here you have a trichomonad in somebody's biofilm that we took from, from a deep pocket. And you'll see bacteria, the, the modal, uh, modal types of bacteria are spirochetes and modal rods with flagellum. Um, this indicates risk factors for the, for the, the periodontal disease. Uh, Paul Kais, back in the 1960s, uh, came up with the idea. There was, there was a big debate among periodontists, which are the specialists in treating uh, periodontal disease. And they, they believed, uh, and I remember the lectures very well back in the 70s, well, we don't really know what causes pockets, but once the pocket forms, the bacteria go in there and they live in the pocket. And so uh, one of the main treatment was to um, sur surgically remove the, the pockets by repositioning the gums. Uh, Paul Kais said, uh, no, let's apply the Koch postulates, and we know that uh, if you have certain bacteria and it causes disease, oh, that's, that's the cause of the disease, and what we really need to focus on is the bacteria. And the periodontists would debate, no, we don't, we don't want to use antiseptics. We, we seldom use antibiotics because what we're really 
What we're really focusing on is the calculus. That's the, the hard, crusty material that builds up. It's been proven that it's not the calculus that causes the destruction because they've done experiments where they've sterilized calculus and they've implanted it and it didn't cause any inflammation. The problem with calculus is it, it's a good uh, place for bacteria to live because of its um, porosities. So bacteria will, uh, uh, these um, bacteria often, especially the spirochetes, will live on the calculus. So it needs to be removed um, in the treatment of the uh, periodontal condition. Uh, okay, this is another one, it's a little bit darker. Uh, this one, sorry, with the big magnification on the screen, it's a little fuzzy, but this is a more, this is a little more active sample showing spirochetes. Treponema denticola. Now there are other uh, bacteria that like to live in deep pockets where there's no oxygen that are not mobile, they don't move around. But by doing these bacterial tests, uh, Dr. Kais, his, his, his question was, well, how do you know when it, it's in remission? How do you know when the disease is in remission and you can um, you know, stop or slow down the treatment? And the only way uh, to really do it with a very sensitive microbiological test is to take samples. Because just like you have um, testing in swimming pools for E. coli, uh, and when you do your, your samples to see um, other infections are in remission, uh, if you, once, once this is treated, even just non-surgically, what we found is that there'll be no more spirochetes, there'll be no more motor rods, the large numbers of white blood cells that were in the pocket disappear, and there's nothing moving. And that would be considered that it's in remission. Um, Unfortunately, this method of monitoring it has kind of disappeared. Basically, uh, it's treated more by going by the symptoms, okay? So probing, if there's bleeding on probing, okay, well, it's, it's active inflammation. Uh, if the pockets are getting deeper because they're being monitored, then it's active. Um, so you could see here uh, mostly spirochetes. Now, one interesting thing was the spirochetes uh, Dr. Kai showed us uh, in our dental school, and he came and he um, debated with the chairman of periodontics, and he showed uh, movies, they didn't have videos, and he showed a movie of spirochetes attached to calculus, and they were moving in a coordinated motion, like cilia. Can you believe that? They were moving in a coordinated, and he, his uh, thought was, well, maybe, because of the flow of uh, fluid in the periodontal pockets, they were pushing out the white blood cells. Maybe that was an ad adaptive mechanism. Uh, but we know, um, in the course of evolution, we know mitochondria originally were bacteria. They have their own DNA. Uh, and very similar to that is your, the chloroplasts in plants. Uh, and uh, the, the, the struct, of course, the both the chloroplasts and the mitochondria produce ATP, uh, and there be, would be a, an advantage for that bacteria and the primitive cell to merge together for energy production and uh, oxidative respiration or ATP production by photosynthesis. So who knows, uh, maybe in 100 million years, spirochetes uh, turned into cilia, who knows. What's next? Okay, so here we have a lower uh, jawbone, a mandible. Okay, so this is the uh, part of the temporomandibular joint where the, the lower jaw is connected into the temporal bone of the upper jaw. Uh, this, the bone here, is what we call the alveolar bone. This is the bone that holds the teeth. The only reason for this bone to be there and form the sockets is to hold the teeth and the teeth stimulate the bone and they keep it there. You'll see down here there's a little hole. This is the mental foramen, where the, the main uh, nerve supply, the alveolar nerve, goes through the alveolar canal through the bone, and it supplies all the teeth, and then it comes out through here and supplies the lip and the, the chin down in here. You'll also see, interesting, there's some impacted, horizontally impacted wisdom teeth in this, in this uh, mandible. Now, what happens when you lose all the teeth? 
Well, the, 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 bone, the alveolar bone resorbs. It disappears. It's no longer stimulated by teeth. And we see unfortunate people where this has happened. Uh, the bone has resorbed. You'll see here's the mental foramen is still there. But the bone is resorbing, and uh, if you look in their mouth, you'll just see gums on top of this bone. How do you chew your food like that? Well, some people are very adaptable. Okay, and here's even further resorption. And look where the mental foramen is now. It's on top of the ridge. Now, if this person was wearing a, uh, a full lower denture, it would be pressing on that, mental, on that nerve there. So we have to make sure that that's relieved. There's no pressure on it. But this is what, this is what can happen when the toothworm gets its way and these teeth are lost. And this is a major, major um, effect on the person's nutrition, their ability to chew their food, to eat the right foods. They often go to a much softer diet. Uh, with uh, uh, loss of the vertical support that the teeth provide, also the, the, the temporomandibular joint is often affected. Um, and it's just a huge uh, change in the quality of life for the patient. And this is the, the tragic thing, this is all preventable, except to, it's just a, a lack of information that the general public has. Um, so, I don't know, maybe you guys can spread the word that people have to practice prevention, uh, control the bacteria, control the frequency of exposure to sugar, and get their gums checked, get their teeth checked. Uh, Going back to those, this, the, the bacterial, um, the biofilm that's in these deep pockets, uh, you know, one of the things that's happening is it's producing what they call um, inflammatory cytokines, which are circulated through the body, and it has other effects on the general health of the body, the different organs. In particular, what I'm concerned about is the endothelial lining of the, of the, the blood vessels, the, especially the arteries, and it's uh, believed that this uh, activates, makes the, the lining of the arteries more reactive. So that in itself is a good idea that you don't to have the, all this inflammation going on in the mouth because of the, the cytokines which are circulated in the body. Um, the other thing is that it's been shown that uh, people with type 2 diabetes, uh, if they have periodontitis, well, that inflammation, that once that's brought into remission and it's controlled, that oftentimes the diabetes improves and the medication has to be adjusted. We know that people with diabetes are more susceptible to this kind of infection, uh, but it's often unknown that, uh, that, that it can improve it by getting rid of this chronic infection. Uh, also, uh, general health, they, it's, it's uh, been determined by statistics that it can affect the birth weight of babies and also uh, premature birth if this inflammation is going on because general effects from the cytokines and other effects that having all this inflammation in the body is, is happening. Oh, and the other thing is uh, those, those inflamed gums, uh, if we're concerned about uh, transient bacteremias, it allows the bacteria to get into the bloodstream because the epithelial lining of the gum tissue is, has come off. And the epithelial lining, the, the gums are, if you consider your skin, you have your epidermis. The skin is a barrier. It's the barrier effect. It keeps the fluids in your body and it keeps the bugs out of your body. The gums are the skin of the mouth. And when they become inflamed like that and the lining of, the, of, these, of the, the tissue is ulcerated, bacteria gain access into the bloodstream. So a person that has that is going to have, and they're chewing on these loose teeth, uh, all this inflammation, they're going to have transient bacteremias daily. So uh, this, is, this is another risk factor. Transient bacteremias. And this is why when uh, the surgeons are doing heart work or they're doing um, orthopedic work, uh, they will often send the patient to us to get a clearance to make sure that they're, they're not having chronic infections like this going on, which could jeopardize the effect of their, their surgeries. Uh, what else you got here? All right, so, okay. So when the teeth are lost, one of, one of the things that, one of the modalities that we use are dental implants. This is um, 
the modern uh, um, cylindrical type implant with threads on it, and this gets implanted into the bone. This is a six, from six, the year 600 AD, a Mayan mandible from Honduras, and it has three implants made of seashells. Imagine that. And I, I think that they, they found that they probably were um, implanted in a live person and, they, and that they were working. Uh, different, different materials have been used for implants, and I remember back in the 70s, I was placing what we, they call um, vitreous garb carbon implants. And uh, these are made out of carbon, and it was like a cylinder of charcoal, but it was much harder. And they worked great. Um, they were implanted, but when you look at them on a, mic on a, um, a radiograph, uh, the carbon was radiolucent, so you didn't see the, the whole implant, you just saw the post that goes down. This, is, uh, what we, this was um, made very famous by Leonard Linkow uh, back in the 60s and 70s. This is the blade, blade implant, uh, and it would, what we would do is make, a, heart, make a, um, a groove in the bone, and this was pushed into the bone, it was sutured over, and uh, you have these posts, and uh, this was used uh, to replace uh, missing teeth. Um, the difference between this kind of implant and the cylindrical titanium ones that we use today is that the, the ones we use today, we, the, they, the bone actually fuses directly to the titanium metal. Uh, with these, uh, this was more like, um, uh, it was not a, a direct fusion of the bone to the implant. It was more like there was a, almost a, um, um, a ligament holding this, uh, so it wasn't as tightly or as intimately uh, uh, connected to the bone. But they did work most of the time. I remember spending a couple of weekends in Dr. Linkow's office, and the first thing he told to the patients was, 20% of every implant I put in eventually have to be removed. You sure you want to do this? And they'd go, yeah. And he would do that, and he would use these blade implants. They're kind of out of favor today because the, the cylindrical ones are much more precise and uh, the different um, mechanism of the fusion to the bone. Okay, so this is an example where we put in some implants. This is a person with no lower teeth. His lower denture was bobbing up and down. The tongue would push it. It was very difficult to chew food. Uh, we put three implants into the anterior mandible here. Um, and then, okay, so in this particular case, we made a bar. This is going back quite a few years. We made a bar with spheres sticking up on the bar. So this is permanently screwed into the implants. The, the denture had uh, reciprocal um, receptacles in there, and these particular ones had um, uh, rubber O-rings. And the O-rings, when you put this on, the O-rings would snap onto the spheres, and guess what? The denture did not move. So this can be a, a huge, a huge game changer for somebody with a full lower denture that's having problems, as long as there's enough bone to put them in. There's different implants, there's even mini implants which are very thin, you don't need that much bone. Okay. And there's the denture in his mouth. He was very happy with that. But we want to prevent this, we want to keep the teeth. They're meant to last your lifetime, we're not meant to be doing all this. This is slow. Okay. All right, some more examples of uh, these cylindrical implants put into the bone. Um, here's an example where there's no tooth here, there's no tooth here. Have to be careful, there's the maxillary sinus. We don't want to have the implant going into the sinuses.
So there they are in the bone. And then we, then we made crowns on those implants. Okay, things can get really bad. This is 1993. This is my next door neighbor in New Jersey. Um, just so I show this, just a couple of cases that you can see that even if you see someone like this or you know someone or a patient, there is still hope. And we can, we can, uh, we can do a lot. So this particular person, um, he was a truck driver. He also was doing, I um, uh, forget what you call it, he was uh, uh, getting people to sign up for a uh, network marketing with uh, certain candy that you could use to give, your, give you energy. Another view of his teeth. Another view looking at the palate. There's the roof of his mouth, all these rotten teeth in there. Uh, okay, here's what we did. We wound up doing, we, we fixed his upper front teeth. We had some budgetary restrictions. These are all fixed using bonded tooth colored filling material. At the, this was the, uh, the state of the art of the filling material at that. This was 1993. So he was a happy guy. Uh, I, I sold my house and moved to a different location. I don't know how long this lasted. Hopefully he stopped eating the candy. Okay, this is another problem that we often run into as far as, it, this is gum recession. You'll see, the, here's the, the crown of the tooth, the enamel goes up to here. This is, from here to here is all root. Now this gum recession is not due to periodontitis. This is due to the position of the teeth in the jawbone and also aggressive tooth brushing. Aggressive tooth brushing where the person's brushing too hard, they actually can push the gums off the roots. And this, of course, jeopardizes the survival of the teeth. All right, what can we do in a case like this where it's, um, there's a lot of recession? Okay, this is alloderm. So we can do a graft. This is alloderm. This is a material that's basically collagen derived from uh, cadaver skin, and it's treated so that there's no um, rejection phenomenon. Every, everything that would do that is, is removed. This can be used for grafting. That's what we did with this fellow. Okay, this is showing the, this, this method was uh, without doing what we call a flap. This was done where we went underneath the gums uh, and we went up and detached the gums from the bone so that the, the, the gums could be brought down and the uh, alloderm was uh, threaded uh, in into the, uh, the opening and then threaded all along in here and positioned so it covered the roots. Okay, so then what we do is we pull the gums down and suture it in place. So the gums, his own gums, are now covering the alloderm. And you see the sutures in there. It's hard for me to see it at this angle, but they're there. And uh, here it is a month later. You still have some of these polypropylene sutures in there. Polypropylene is like fishing line. It's very non-reactive, uh, and you can leave it in there for quite a while while this healing is all taking place. This is eight months later. So we got a very nice result, and it looks just as good uh, today. It's a very, very permanent result. Okay, this is another extreme case uh, where we used a different method. Uh, you'll see this gum recession. Um, as long as there's, there's bone in between the teeth to support uh, the gums, we can do th this kind of procedure. Uh, so what would you do with a tooth like this? Would you extract it and do an implant or make a bridge? Well, we decided to save the tooth. And this is, um, this is with a flap, flap procedure where the gums are, are peeled off the bone and off the roots. This tooth, the, the, the tip of the, um, 
of the root was exposed, um, the root canal treatment was done to remove the nerve, and a filling was put into the, the tip of the root. The root has to be um, uh, grinded back a little bit so it's more even with the bone. And then what we use is what we call sub-epithelial um, tissue graft, where what we do is we take some of the, um, the gum tissue from the palate. If you, if you take your tongue and you put it on the roof of your mouth and you feel over to the side where, where your back teeth are touching there, that's very tough fibrous connective tissue, gum tissue. We take some of that and then we suture it with resorbable sutures over these defects. There's the, there's the, um, the, the, the palate the palatal tissue. And then we um, suture the, the gums over that, over that palatal tissue. So this is two and a half weeks post-op. This is where the defect was. And this is um, two years later. And you can see it's, the, the tissue is all keratinized. It's a tough fibrous gum tissue here, which is not likely to, to recede again. And the nice thing about this procedure also is that it's the same color as the person's gum tissue. As, uh, there are other methods of doing this, but anyway, it can, there are things we can do to save a tooth, even with that severe gum recession. The thing is, well, don't brush too aggressively that where you're pushing the gums off the roots. Uh, people will often scrub back and forth at the gum line and um, overdo it and also cause grooves in the roots. We call it toothbrush abrasion. Another uh, word is uh, cervical abfraction, where some people believe clenching the teeth will also cause that type of a problem. Uh, so this is a person, this was an elderly lady from Germany, and uh, she was a mess. Now, not only were the teeth rotting away due to de decay, also we had uh, severe attrition of these lower teeth. This is from grinding the teeth together, rubbing the teeth together all the time. And uh, having lived through World War II, she probably was under a lot of stress in her life at that time and carried over. But when she, bit, when she bit down, she had this collapsed bite, you see? She was missing so many teeth. These, these teeth that were worn down by attrition were practically hitting the gums here. Now, uh, it used to always be thought that this attrition or bruxism grinding of the teeth occurred mostly in sleep. And there were recent studies done where it's been shown that probably most of the grinding of the teeth is during the daytime. So night guard helps uh, when you're sleeping, but during the daytime, what I tell people to do it is play a little game called don't let your teeth touch. And when we were kids, we had a, we had a superstition, which was uh, if you step on a crack, you'll break your mother's back. So we were walking to and from school we, on the sidewalk. We never stepped on cracks even though it was ridiculous, but we had that in our mind and it was a superstition. And um, I'd say, you know, make this a superstition. It's not good if your teeth are touching. Keep them always a little bit apart because it's probably triggering a clenching and grinding reflex. Subconsciously, you don't even know you're doing it. Anyway. Okay, so she needed some root canal treatments on some of these front teeth, which were down to the gum line. So the, the pulps or the nerves were removed. This is looking at the palate here. It's easy to get disoriented with these photos. But okay, so now these, the top teeth, um, these were all built up. These were all built up uh, with uh, posts and composites. And then, I'm almost done, hang on. Okay, this is what we achieved. This is crowns on the, the, the teeth, and these were the ones that were worn down. And she was happy as a lark. And she took this with her to her grave. So it was definitely life-changing. OK, another quickie. This is a panoramic x-ray, just so you could see. Sometimes we do lots of root canal treatments and build up of these teeth. Root canals everywhere. You see there's the maxillary sinus up in there. So all of this can be done. Another 
gruesome thing. This call could be prevented. This could all be prevented. And this is why I, I'm kind of passionate about trying to get the word out. But it's lack of knowledge. It's lack of understanding of what causes it. And it's basically, and this particular fellow, OK, these, are, these teeth were crowned on the bottom. And that's what he looked like. And then we did some implants on the posterior mandible to give him some teeth that are not removable. I'm almost done, don't worry. And this is on the other side, uh, implants. These are the post, the, these implants were cemented, uh, the crowns were cemented on the implants. And this shows uh, some uh, crowns cemented on the implants on the back teeth. So that made a huge difference in this guy's life. But he let it go way too far. OK, this is what we want, just natural, natural, beautiful teeth. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Dr. Wright, thank you so very much for that informative presentation. A lot to chew on there for us.